The following program is a production of Truth for the World. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, oh, what words I hear him say. In order for a person to go to heaven, a change must occur in that person. A person must be converted to Christ. Matthew chapter 18 verse 3 says, Verily I say unto you, unless you are converted and become like little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And there is no doubt then that people must be converted in order to be saved. The natural question then is, how are people converted? Is it based upon their faith in the Word of God? Is it based upon faith working with the grace of God that brings men to salvation? In other words, is it something that God does to man naturally through His Word? Uh, something within the Word of God that causes one to so move and change his life based upon the grace of God so that he is converted to following the Christ? Or is it something that God does to man supernaturally? Meaning that God comes to a, a man and forces him by his supernatural operation of the Holy Spirit to obey his will. And, and then a man can have a change of heart and be converted. And these are the questions that we will deal with today as we discuss the fourth petal on the Calvinistic tulip that we've been talking about uh, for a long time. The fourth is called the I. It stands for irresistible grace. Uh, again, listen to Calvinist Brian Schwartley. The Calvinistic doctrine of efficacious or irresistible grace can be understood only if one has a correct understanding of total depravity and the doctrine of regeneration. He continues on the same page, he says, Because man is spiritually dead, only a radical, all-pervasive change in man's heart can enable him to embrace Jesus Christ. In order for God's grace to be sufficient for any man, it must be efficacious, meaning having the power to produce a desired effect, or we might say not able to be resisted. Only the power of God working directly upon the human soul can infuse it with new life. And so here it is. Here is a man, he cannot, according to the Calvinist, he cannot do anything in the world to even desire to change. He cannot think about God. He cannot want to make a change and, and do right. He has absolutely no free will to do anything spiritually. And so what has to happen is that God, by His Holy Spirit, must come, and, and whether the man wants to change or not, which Calvinists say he can't even want to change, here's a man doesn't even want to change, doesn't care to follow God, but the Holy Spirit comes and forces. That's the irresistible part. He forces that man to change. And so again, man has no choice but to obey God. Now Calvinists will try to get around the idea that God forces a person to obey. For instance, Edwin H. Palmer in his book called The Five Points of Calvinism says on page 35, contrary to what most people think, the Calvinist teaches that man is free, 100% free, free to do exactly what he wants. God does not coerce a single one against his will. And just because man is free, man is a slave. Just because man does what he wants to do, man has no free will, which is different from saying that he is free. Well, that's confusing, right? But he also says on page 36, incidentally, now, the Christian has no free will either. He may technically have the external option to choose or reject Christ, but basically he does not. Christ will not let him reject him. And so we see that according to Calvinism, a man has no freedom to choose. And so in the end, God is the one who forces salvation and damnation upon people, at least according to Calvinism. Calvinism teaches that God comes and irresistibly. That is, he gives no person choice, but forces a change upon the heart of the individual so that he then must follow God. Uh, the way a puppet does exactly what the puppet master says. And so that's the idea, that the Holy Spirit in a supernatural way comes to a person and changes his heart. And upon that change of heart, the person will obey God. So we have two options before us today. Uh, number one, as we mentioned, the Holy Spirit comes to a soul who has absolutely no desire to follow God. And then all of a sudden, now he will follow God because the Holy Spirit has changed his heart. Or, 
The second option is that a person hears the Word of God, believes what he hears. Upon his belief, he, with the help of God through his Word and his providence, the man proves his faith by following after God. Now, we will not go through every single passage of Scripture. I'm just hopeful that we can whet your appetite and cause you to want to study the Word of God even more. And in it, I'm sure that you can read your Bible and come to the truth as God has said it. But let's go ahead and start right here where the Calvinist likes to begin. They use a, a lady named Lydia as their prime example. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 14, we read, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worship God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Uh, that's generally where they start, right there in verse 14. But let's notice a few things in the context of this passage. And let's ask the question, did the Holy Spirit make her believe? Or did the words spoken cause her to believe? Well, let's start reading in verse 13. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. We sat down and spake unto the woman which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Notice verse 14 says, There was a woman, and she was already worshiping God. Now, this isn't going to work for the Calvinist because the Spirit must first come to her before she can worship God. But the text clearly says, A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us. Not only was she already worshipping God, but notice it says, She heard us. Well, heard us what? What were they doing there? Were they talking about football? Were they... Uh, performing a stand-up comedy routine? No. They were there and they were preaching. And the text says, she heard them. And then it says, the Lord opened her heart. So how did that happen? How did the Lord open her heart? I suggest to you that it happened the same way it does today. By the Word of God being sown into the hearts of men. And by His Word, He changed her. It's also interesting to note that it wasn't until after her baptism that she knew that she was faithful and she invited them to her house. He opened her heart by the Word of God. That is why uh, Jesus would give the parable of the seeds and the soils. You remember he says over in Luke chapter 8 and verse 11, it says, Now the parable is this, the seed is the Word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Jesus said, Jesus said it, not me. He, he said, the seed is the word of God. And then he said, the devil comes and he takes away the word. Why? Unless they should believe and be saved. The word spoken or preached is allowed to linger. And if it is planted in the right heart, the word will open up that heart and the person will be saved. That's what we see in Lydia. And that's what we see, folks, even today. I submit to you today that the Holy Spirit of God wrote the Word of God through inspired writers. He spoke through men in the first century, but once those inspired men died, the Holy Spirit had given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness in the Word of God. Today, the Spirit of God leads all men to salvation by the use of the Word of God. I want to say to you today that uh, the way victories are won is by the soldiers doing f the fighting. Uh, the way battles have been pictured throughout history and, and certainly in, in the days of the apostles is that soldiers stood with their weapons drawn for battle. And with their weapon, they were victorious. Well, friend, I, I suggest to you that what 
God said a, a great while ago uh, that the, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And when the Word of God is wielded properly, uh, the Word of God is the victor. Yes, the Holy Spirit is the one holding the sword, but the sword is the means by which the Holy Spirit does His fighting. Uh, notice Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Paul did not say the sword of the Spirit is not the Word of God. Paul didn't say the sword of the Spirit is sometimes the Word of God. He said the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Holy Spirit cannot be separated from His Word. Uh, therefore, anyone claiming a direct operation of the Holy Spirit today denies Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. The direct operation of the Holy Spirit today is a false tenet of Calvinism. It seems that once the position of the direct operation of the Holy Spirit on the, on the human spirit is taken, the power and the place of the Word of God loses its luster. Folks, this idea of irresistible grace has the Holy Spirit acting for God in such a way that it makes the Bible of, of no effect for anyone. Ah, but you say, well, do you believe that the Holy Spirit does anything today? Oh, yes. Uh, we all agree that the Holy Spirit operates today, but the question is how? If directly, that is, in addition to the Word of God, uh, then the Calvinistic position is, is taken wherein the Holy Spirit is, at least at times, separated from His Word, from His medium. If, however, He acts only through the Word of God, then the text in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 is correct. Folks, the Calvinist says the Word of God does not save that it's the Holy Spirit, but I want us to see what the Bible says. James chapter 1 and verse 21 says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, what was it that was able to save people's souls? The engrafted word of God. Now, folks, uh, we want to go through something very methodically for your benefit today, and that is this. I submit to you that the Holy Spirit acts today upon the hearts of men by using His sword, the, the sword which belongs to the Holy Spirit, which is the Word of God. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 20, we hear these words, Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withholdest not thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. And so they say, uh, see, the Holy Spirit instructs people. We agree, of course He does. Uh, the question is, how does He instruct people? Does He do it directly, miraculously? Or does He do it indirectly by the, the word spoken or written? Uh, but look at verse 30 of the same passage. Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testified against them, uh, by thy spirit in thy prophets. Yet would they not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the land. How were they instructed? By the spirit in the prophets. The word of God spoken and written by the prophets. The same is true in the New Testament as well. Notice 2 Timothy chapter 3 beginning in verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And so, yes, we agree the Holy Spirit does indeed instruct. He does it not miraculously in some special feeling, but through the Word of God. So then they say, well, the Spirit is responsible for the new birth. And they go to John chapter 3 verse 5 which says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a, a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, so how is it then that we are born again by the Spirit? Well, let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 1 and read verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Uh, 
How does the Spirit participate in the new birth? By the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So they say, well, the, the Holy Spirit uh, makes things alive or it, it quickens them. And they go to John chapter 6 and verse 63 and says, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Uh, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Of course, it says the, the words are spirit and life, according to this very passage. But look over at Psalm chapter 119 and verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. We agree, folks, that the Holy Spirit does instruct, that he does quicken. He does so with the word of God, which is his sword, uh, his instrument by which he works. Well, then they say, well, the Holy Spirit teaches, and, and that's true. They use John chapter 14, 26, which is really a passage intended for uh, the audience that day, those apostles who were there with him. But the verse reads, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, and he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Well, how does he teach today? The same author will tell us in John chapter 6, verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Notice they shall be taught of God, so that when they hear and they learn, then they come to the Father. Not by some miraculous feeling of the Holy Spirit, but by the Word of God. And then they say, well, He convicts people. I mean, go to John chapter 16 and verse 7. Uh, of course, speaking again to the apostles, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come... He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, how will he do it? Uh, oh, it's certain that he's going to convince the world. How is he going to do it? Uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 9 says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. By, by holding fast the faithful word, he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. It is by His Word that He will convince them. Well, the Holy Spirit comforts us. Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Yes, they were walking in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. But how? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and let's read verse 3 together. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble. But the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So, however, we are we, we are to comfort one another, is the same way that God comforts us. That's what we learn from this passage. So then, how is it that we comfort one another? Well, notice what Paul wrote in the Word of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We are all comforted in the same way, by words. Spiritually, by the Word of God. And so the Holy Spirit saves us and uh, we, uh, we'll go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Again, we agree. He absolutely does save us. He washes us, justifies us. But the question, folks, is how does He do it? Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 13. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, 
who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. How are we washed? How does the Holy Spirit wash us? Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The Holy Spirit strengthens us. According to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. And so the Spirit strengthens us according to faith. That is how Christ dwells there. We know then that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10 17. But also notice back in Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 8. It says, Therefore shall you keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that you may be strong. Uh, notice, what was it that gave them strength? The obedience to the Word of God. Again, we are led by the Spirit. According to Romans chapter 8, verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The question is, how? How does the Spirit lead? Well, the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto f to my feet and a light unto my path. It is the Spirit leading. But how is He doing it? Using the precious word of God. Notice here on our chart. It is true that the, the Holy Spirit uh, does do all of these things, but, but He uses a means. Uh, he uses the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God to do it. And you can see on our chart here all the different things that He does, but He does it through the Word. The same way a man will use an axe to chop down a tree, the tree will be chopped all right. Uh, the man will be the one who chopped it, but how did he chop the tree? He did so by using the axe. Yes, uh, uh, the, the Holy Spirit converts sinners, but how does He do it? He uses a medium. He uses the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let's turn again over to Acts chapter 2. You, you remember the scene, Peter and the other apostles, they stand to deliver their message. People uh, heard the sermon presented that day and they responded. Now, according to the Bible, let's notice how it all happened. So they are here on the day of Pentecost, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. The Holy Spirit inspires these men. They begin to speak in different languages or in different tongues. Notice verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? And so they were speaking by, the, by a, a miraculous event. The apostles were speaking, being guided by the Holy Spirit. But the men in the audience didn't have a, a miracle upon their hearts. They were simply listening to the words proclaimed by the apostles. Verse 14 says, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you. And hearken to my words. And then Peter preaches a great lesson on who Jesus was and how it was that they had killed the Savior of the world. And after he spoke his lesson, notice verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter, to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were pricked in their hearts. Why? Because the Holy Spirit came into each of their hearts in some sort of secret, miraculous fashion and forced them to believe no. According to the Bible, when they heard the Word of God, the words caused them to have a change, to be pricked in their hearts. The Word did that. Now notice what the Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, 
and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God gets to the very heart and the Word either causes people to change their lives or the Word of God causes people to harden their hearts. Remember in Acts chapter 7, Stephen stands before the Jews of his day and he is going to preach to them a lesson. His intent, of course, was to change the hearts of the people. But notice the reaction to his sermon in Acts 7 and verse 54. The people heard these things. They were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. Notice they had a different reaction to the word of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Well, what was it that caused their hearts to be hardened? Well, it was their own stubbornness, but it was the word of God that caused the reaction. Folks, that takes us back to the words of our Lord over in Luke chapter 8 and verse 11, where it says, Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. It is the word of God that is planted in the good soil of the good heart that causes a person to believe and be faithful, not a miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And so folks, we're seeing again that irresistible grace is also no good according to the Word of God. Sitting at the feet of Jesus Oh, what words I hear Him say Happy place so near, so precious May it find me there each day Sitting at the feet of Jesus I would look upon the past For His love has been so gracious It has won my heart at last Sitting at the feet of Jesus Where can mortal be more blessed? There I lay my sins and sorrows And when weary find sweet rest If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America, or visit us online at tftw.org. The preceding program was a production of Truth For The World, a work of the Duluth Church of Christ.